What is item response theory? Good question. Uh, it's a theory of measurement. So I'm going to be talking about measurement theory a little bit. Uh, it's actually a psychometric theory. Like all good things in science, psychometrics is just a nice Greek long word to make something simple sound complicated. So hopefully that's the aim of the talk, to make something that sometimes comes across in the literature as a bit obscure. Just look at the fundamental principles. So when we talk about measurement, I'm going to be talking about a particular psychometric theory, which is uh, item response theory. And I'm going to be talking about a little bit about a family of statistical models that can be used to estimate uh, these sort of models. Not too much on the stats, though. So it'll be mostly about the fundamental theoretical ideas behind these. So why is item response theory important? Well, at the end of the day, we want to demonstrate that the measurements that we take are reliable and valid, and that they tell us something about the thing that we're interested in. So if someone puts a thermometer in your mouth and tells you you're ill, you want to have some basis for believing it. If somebody puts a questionnaire in your hand and you fill it out, and they give you some sort of label, like saying you're a post-materialist, then again, why should you believe them? Um, someone interviews you and then says something about what narrative, you know, how they interpret the narrative uh, account that you, you've given to them. Again, why should you believe what this person tells you? What's the basis for the validity of the measurement? And so item response theory is just a, a method that purports to give this uh, validity. So I'm going to talk about a familiar example of measuring people to just give an idea of the idea that measurement is it often seems very simple and straightforward, but there's a lot of underlying theory to measurement. I'm going to be talking uh, a little bit about a particular measurement theory called Rash theory, after Professor Rash. I'm going to be saying somewhat, uh, not too much, about a couple of statistical models that aim to uh, test and, and look at whether this rash theory uh, at all conforms to any given set of data. And I'm going to be giving you lots of resources for how you might then go away if you want to and then learn to use uh, IRT in your work. I've got quite a lot to get through, so what I'll probably do is if we leave questions for the end, but if anything's not clear, please do stop me. And, uh, and ask for a clarification. There's no point ploughing on through uh, if nothing's clear. So, with that out of the way, I shall begin. Measurement. Okay, you're probably familiar with the idea of taking body temperature. And you might be aware that this can be used to decide whether or not you're ill. So you take a measurement tool, in this case a mercury thermometer, which is just a, a you know, glass tube with a little bulb of mercury at one end. You stick it in your mouth. The mercury slowly heats up and it matches the temperature of your mouth, hopefully. There's a scale marked on the tube. The mercury expands upon heating, pushing up into the tube, and it comes to rest at a point corresponding to on, on this scale. Uh, and so there's hopefully a relationship between the, the actual the density of the mercury, the extent to which it's expanded, and some idea of this abstract thing called temperature, which we're trying to gauge. And then we don't stop there. We might have decided, right, we've got some measurement about uh, temperature, but we might want to make some further inference about that. And we might want to say, OK, well, your mouth temperature is you know, related to your core body temperature. Core body temperature is usually very stable. If it goes out of certain limits, then that might indicate certain types of illness. Uh, and your doctor will be very unhappy, like that person there. So to make an inference between taking the temperature uh, and then, say, deciding whether or not you're ill requires a hell of a lot of theoretical jumps and steps for something that might appear very, very, you know, just because it's familiar, it might seem as though it's easy. These steps are all hidden away. The idea of thermal equilibrium between the thermometer and your mouth reached via conduction, not convection step. The proportionality of mercury density uh, with a conceptual measurement scale of temperature. The relationship between mouth and core body temperature, which again isn't, you know, mouth isn't sometimes uh, considered the best way to take temperature. Uh, there are other places you can stick a thermometer to get a better uh, relationship of that type. And even the relationship between core body temperature and illness isn't a given. There's certain parameters about whether your temperature is too high for how long or too low or exactly how those things work. An important thing to remember when we're measuring things is that error might intrude at any particular point. Um, so given all those little theoretical steps I've talked about earlier, well we have this thermal equilibrium uh, stage where you have to hold the thermometer in your mouth for long enough for it to reach equilibrium with your mouth, to, for the temperature of your mouth and the temperature of the mercury to equalise with one another. But again, I, I might take the thermometer out too quickly. So 
it might not have had time to reach equilibrium. The expansion of mercury is actually affected by other things other than temperature. So this proportionality between temperature and mercury, for instance air pressure, was something that confused temperature measurement a few hundred years ago before they decided to put them in vacuum tubes. Mouth temperature might not ref reflect core body temperature. I've just suggested that was the case. But again, behavioural factors, so like you know the old trick of dodging school, quick cup of tea, stick the thermometer in, mum doesn't know any wiser, because mums don't know about that sort of stuff. And core body temperature does not vary, uh, you know, with illness in a particularly linear way. And it's not even completely stable in health. So there's a nice graph of somebody's body temperature over the course of a day, very by more uh, than a degree. So it starts to question this idea, well, okay, even if we, you know, think about this thing as a stable quantity, we can see it's not stable. Um, and so error intrudes at all points into measurement. And error, by error, I mean the extent to which it impedes our ability to make inference at each of these steps. So hopefully I've got over the idea that even in a familiar example, measurement can be quite tricky, requires a lot of theory behind it, really. What are the key features of these uh, theoretical constructs? Well, we want rules, in, a, in effect, some rules for mapping observations onto conceptual structures. So we have this conceptual idea of a theory of measurement. We want to map on you know, the height of mercury in a tube onto that. Now, how do we do that mapping? We've got to have some idea of a scaling, quantitative, qualitative, exactly what are we mapping onto what. So density of mercury with a, a quantitative temperature scale, OK, that's a reasonably quantitative sort of mapping. You could think about whether concepts such as you know, having uh, higher or lower temperature, twice as much versus half temperature. That only works for Kelvin scale, not centigrade. But the, you know, the mapping of body temperature onto illness, that's a very uh, you know, non-linear and, and perhaps not quantitative sort of mapping. And finally, error. Where does error come in? How does that affect the mapping between the observations and the, the conceptual scale? And this idea of bias versus variance. Are we always consistently going to get wrong our measurement in one particular way, the idea of bias? Or are we sometimes going to be guessing wrong in, in different ways? The idea of variance around a sort of true measurement. So there's a couple of key features I would put to you that all, all measurement, really, um, should take into account. But often in psychometrics, which is this idea of measuring what people think, feel, believe, and so forth, often these things aren't made explicit. Uh, often we take shortcuts, and sometimes that can harm our ability to make inference about measurements. So... Making measurements about people, uh, you know, uh, absenting the idea of brain scanners and things like that and clairvoyance, we can't really see what people are thinking. Uh, so we have to base what we think is going on inside based on things we can see, how they behave, they speak, their um, uh, body movements, they raise their eyebrows, um, they write something down on a questionnaire, they interact with people in a particular way. We get observations and we're going to try and make inferences about the internal states of these people. Oh, there you go. There's a nice little picture that, that tells you just that. Observations mapped onto constructs using some theory. So we've seen what the theory is for uh, temperature. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the theory, a particular psychometric theory uh, called item response theory. And I've probably belaboured that point quite a lot, so I'll move quickly on. Uh, so I'll narrow it this down. Rather than talking generally about psychometric theory, I'll be talking particularly about... Uh, psychometric measurement using questionnaires. That's a, a very, very well-worn tool in psychometric uh, circles. It's not the only thing that you can use that this sort of theory for. You know, a, a Rorschach test. You've got some sort of weird ink blots and somebody who rates them. Uh, that, again, you could apply these sort of ideas exactly uh, to that sort of stuff. In fact, anything you can measure about, the, about someone that you've got some belief that it tells you something about some internal state, you can you know, use psychometric theory. Uh, upon. But I'm going to be talking about this idea of measuring internal traits. Uh, could be personality traits. Intelligence would be the classic uh, one that people tried to get a handle on uh, over 100 years ago. The idea is that there's something internal to someone, a trait, I'll call it, such as intelligence, and we can't see that directly, but we believe it's got some correlates in terms of things that we can see. And so we try and construct a device, a questionnaire, that then get somebody to produce responses that are going to be mapped on to that trait in some way, using some scaling rules that we can try and get at uh, what, this internal, what these internal states are. I'm going to be talking about uh, a particular situation where we get a questionnaire 
that people give us binary responses. But don't be too fooled by the idea of exactly what type of measurement scale, whether it's a five-point Likert scale or a visual analog scale. That's not the important thing, I would suggest. Uh, it's more the, just the, the rules for how we decide mapping on what people do and what we observe onto these constructs that's the, the important part. But for the purposes of this uh, particular um, theory I'll be talking about, it is assumed that this trait, uh, whatever it is, is in some sense continuous. You can have more or less of it. You can have a bit of it or a lot of it or other amounts in between. And so we're trying to map on people's discrete responses to items on a questionnaire onto some sort of continuous internal state uh, that people might have. And for instance, what people often do with questionnaires is if they think they've got some questions that all speak to the same topic, they'll just add up all the scores. They'll say, right, I've got these binary responses, I'll add them all up. Um, and sometimes that might be a reasonable way of, of gauging what somebody's internal state is. But I'm going to go through whether or not, looking at what the steps that might be required to decide whether that's reasonable, um, what's the justification for doing that sort of thing. Okay, so here you go. Here's my totally made up example of uh, a psychometric trait, a, the idea of perceived disposable wealth. How much disposable money to spend uh, that isn't otherwise accounted for do you have? And I've got a few questionnaire items. So if I wanted to, uh, they're all based around this stem. So if I wanted to, I could probably afford to do the following this month. Buy a cup of coffee. Save £10. Buy a book about sheds. Buy a new fridge. Buy a Learjet. So I've got my questions, and you might go through those and just take yes or no. I believe that I've got enough disposable wealth to do that this month if I wanted to. So what's the key idea? So we've got some questions there, and I'm trying to work out the trait of disposable wealth. What I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and map the people and the items both onto the same continuous scale. I'm going to say that there's this sort of hypothetical scale whereby you've got sort of no disposable wealth at one end and vast amounts of it at the other. And I'm going to say, OK, well, I could probably place the items in terms of how much uh, disposable wealth they required to purchase them on this scale. So I'd say, OK, well, coffee, that's sort of down here. You don't need very much, although bloody Starbucks, like they would take, you know, <laughs> half an arm off you to get a cup of coffee off you these days. A book, perhaps, I don't know, if I was a canny buyer, I could get my book about sheds for perhaps eight ninety-five. Um, so I know that. Um, I might be able to save £10. That's got a quite explicit anchor in terms of a unit of money. So again, there's perhaps less you know, differences in terms of people's perceptions about you know, whether or not they've got £10 to save that month. Um, fridge, and then Learjet all the way along here. I haven't quite defined exactly what type of scale that is. Um, whether it's some sort of linear or, or, or what scale, but again, we could probably agree on the rough orderings uh, of those things. And what I want to do really is use my well, use some sense of knowledge about these uh, mappings about the items, and you know, and use that for inference about where people lie on this scale. So the idea of giving people a questionnaire is usually to try and work out where other you know people lie on this scale. So at the one end, you've got world's richest man, TM Carlos Slim. I've put Wayne Rooney. I don't think he could afford a Learjet this month. I'm not sure. But, you know, who knows? He might be able to. He might just be uh, keeping it quiet. Average, uh, sorry, the UK population, of those at the average of uh, household income, based around 2010 figures, 30% of households can't afford to save £10 uh, a month. So, but, you know, most of us down this sort of end of us of that sort of end, perhaps a log scale might be good um, for this. But the key idea here is that we're mapping these two things onto the same conceptual scale. So some items require greater disposable wealth, so I can see the items like say, well, they're cheap or they're expensive. Some participants have got greater or lesser uh, perceived disposable wealth. Some people are poor, some people are wealthy. Okay, so if the participant wealth is greater than the item cost, and perhaps I could use that as a way of working out whether I'm likely to see a positive response or not to these uh, items. So the level of the positive item response tells us something about where the participant uh, lies. So if we've got, you know, if we've got lots, if we've got a few responses that are positive, we could assume that somebody's lying down towards the, the low end, and lots of responses, um, then perhaps you can afford a Learjet and you're right at the other end. 
So we've got a hypothetical individual here, individual A, um, and they're at this level here. So we can see, right, okay, their level of uh, wealth, because we, we don't know it, but if, if we could see it, their level of wealth at this level means that we should expect to see, uh, if their level of wealth is greater than a coffee, so we should expect to see them endorse the coffee item, and the same for a book and the save, but not a fridge or a Learjet. That would be in an ideal world. Just talked about the idea that error intrudes upon measurement. And so we shouldn't really expect a one-to-one -one mapping. We should expect a probabilistic mapping. People will have different estimates about how much things cost. Uh, they'll have different knowledge about how much money they actually have available. And, and things like does available mean credit. Wishful thinking. You know, just hoping you have more cash than you do. Um, and the idea that disposable wealth changes over time. Uh, it's not a fixed trait. So again, there might be lots of uh, sources of error uh, in this. So I'm not going to be expecting to see nice clean cut divisions between people. I'm going to expect for, for any given level of trait, I'm likely to see a, you know, a perhaps 50% of people tick yes or 20% of people tick no. I won't know for definite about these things. Um, so for instance, here's two more hypothetical people. So what I might expect is for people around this sort of trait level, uh, of, of person A, I might expect perhaps a highish probability, a probability of between zero and one. I might expect the highest probability of a person um, being able to buy a cup of coffee, and perhaps uh, a lowish probability of them being able to afford a fridge. And perhaps the key idea here would be that when you go above somebody's supposed trait wealth, we're likely to see probabilities of less than 50%. You know, we, we're just less likely than, than not to see a positive response. And when we're below that personal wealth, we're likely to see a higher than 50% response. That would be this idea. So we get this idea of a, a probabilistic mapping, where we've just got high probability of item response for items less than your wealth, low probability for items greater than your wealth. Um, and so we get a sense that people exist somewhere on the scale. People have got a probability of endorsing stuff. And items have got a probability of being endorsed. So again, this idea of people and items cross-cutting on the same scale. So coffee, cheap, highly likely to be uh, endorsed. Learjet, expensive, highly unlikely uh, to be endorsed. So probabilities. Now we start, so that, so that basically maps out a lot of the theory without going into the details. But that's sort of the main idea of the theory behind a particular type of item response theory. Um, this idea of taking a latent construct you know, that's got a, a continuous distribution and mapping items and people onto it onto the same scale. When we're actually looking at statistically modeling this sort of thing, uh, we've got this probabilistic idea. Probabilities aren't really very convenient for modeling with continuous measures that just assume unbounded responses. So probabilities sort of bump up against zero at one end and one at the other end. So it's a bit inconvenient when you're trying to take differences and things around those points. So it's much easier to model a transformation of uh, a probability that ranges from minus infinity all the way to uh, positive infinity. And so a familiar one for anyone who does a bit of stats might be aware of the logic transformation um, of the sort used in uh, uh, logistic regression, where you, it's just like converting pounds to dollars or something like that, except it's nonlinear. So we're just transforming a, a, a way of representing more likely or less likely from a probability, which is a bit inconveniently bounded, to uh, a logic, which isn't, in, which isn't uh, bounded at all. So you just take the odds, which is the probability over 1 minus the probability, and take the log of that, and that you get a nice symmetrical measure that's got a 0, that means 50-50 chance, and then as you go higher in the logic scale, that means you've got a you know, greater probability of seeing a, an item endorsement in this case, and as you go uh, below 0 into negative numbers, you've got a, a less than 50-50 chance the lower you go. And that's the relationship between uh, a probability uh, and a logit. So a 0 logit, 50% chance uh, of seeing the outcome. Uh, as the logic goes down, the probability goes down, but it never quite reaches zero, and we, it just tracks on and on and on forever. Same at the upwards one. It's just more convenient for statistical modeling. So that's probably the most technical bit we'll get to. Let's think now about how we might go about modeling uh, this relationship between people uh, and items. I'm going to present to you a statistical model, so brace yourselves. It is something equals something minus something else. So actually very, very simple. So we've got the logit or the probability that somebody is going to endorse an item is equal to, as we saw earlier, 
the wealth that that person has minus the cost of the item. So if the person is, say, zero on the scale of, uh, of this thing, you know, about average, uh, and then the item costs less than zero, then that's going to be positive, and we're going to have a greater than 50-50% chance, you know, of, of seeing an item response. If the item is, say, you know, costs two on this scale, and the person's only at zero, we're going to have a minus two logic, which is, you know, down there in the very low probability of seeing something. So it's just really the wealth of the person minus the cost equals the probability of observing the outcome. Now that obviously, just like earlier, it's not sciencey enough, so I've got to make it look more complicated. So there's the one you'll see in the textbook. Uh, y, or perhaps U, I, J equals theta J minus B, I. And all that means is that you've got the logic for person I, uh, for item I, for person J, that the, you know, the logic that you'll see an item endorsement, the probability that you're seeing a group of people endorse the item. You've got the trait level that you're trying to work out of the person, where they lie on this scale. Um, and person J, and then you've got uh, the difficulty or the cost. It's in, in general for these uh, item response theories, this parameter would be called the difficulty, or perhaps you might call it a threshold, a bit about over which you've got to pass before you're likely to see a positive item response um, for that. And this model is called a one parameter item response theory model, or a RASH model. But it's a general model. It's, you know, so I've used a particular example there. I'm going to show you another one that's not made up later on. Uh, I can get some nice, rather than look at you know, dry, dull uh, numbers and things like that, I can use this equation to map out, as we saw earlier, the probability of item responses based around person, uh, people's trait level disposable wealth in this case um, and see what we might expect. So these are called item characteristic curves because we get one per item. We had five items earlier, coffee, sheds that sort of stuff oh yeah here we go so we've got book about sheds and fridge so what we see here is that to have a 50 50 chance of observing a positive item response for the book item you have to have a trait level of about minus one this is zero these are just on logic res responses so that we'd expect that you know about half of all people less than half of people to be able to afford a fridge and more than half of people would be able to afford uh, a book so the idea is these, they track the thing. So if you've got very low perceptions of your disposable wealth down here, then you're going to have a very low probability of endorsing either of these items. But at any given point, for any given point along the disposable wealth latent trait, if you call it, you're going to be more likely, more probable, to see an item response positively for the book item than for the fridge item. Because as we saw earlier, people perceive generally books to be cheaper than fridges. So, you know, if you had a, a trait of about plus three, then you have very high probability of either, but you still have a high probability of each seeing a uh, you know, book item endorsed than you would for a fridge. So that's just a graphical way of representing these item parameters in relation to these, you know, this idea of an underlying trait to get a sense for, uh, yeah, how these items are responding, what are they telling us uh, about uh, the person. Oh, uh, and there you go. That's just, you know, the, the B parameter reflects the point at which these curves pass the 50-50 point, the, uh, the 0.5 probability. Another thing, you know, you know before we get even uh, particularly more complicated about this, uh, there's something important that these uh, curves can tell us, is the idea that these particular items don't all tell us uh, with equal precision about the same, uh, about different points on this scale. So the idea is it's important about where you where you hope to find out about people in terms of where they exist on this latent scale, in terms of what sort of questions you might ask them. So, for instance, if I ask people uh, about whether or not they've got a Learjet, for virtually all of this latent trait along here, from very low levels up to really quite high levels, this item is almost completely uninformative because everyone says zero to it. It's you know it might tell me the difference between Carlos Slim and Wayne Rooney, but it's not going to really tell me the difference between anyone else. And similarly, asking people whether they can afford a coffee uh, is not particularly informative for most of the upper part of the scale, because just about everyone can afford a coffee. So these sort of items that exist at the extremes are going to be useful. For instance, if I ask someone, can you afford a coffee, and they say no, I've got a lot of information about this part of the scale. You know, that's told me something very significant about their perceived disposable wealth. And if you can afford a Learjet, similarly. But the idea is that these items, then, are more or less appropriate for assessing the trait level at different points of the scale. They're not all as just as good as each other, 
uh, for assessing different parts of, of the latent continuum. So these B uh, factors, these sort of uh, item difficulty parameters, are really quite important for deciding whether or not I've got a, uh, a questionnaire, say, that I'm trying to assess happiness, like the, you know, the, uh, the ONS is trying to do at the moment. And if I perhaps give that to a group of people who are clinically depressed, and it's, you know, that might not be as useful as if I give it to a, a group from the uh, general population. Because I'm going to have to have a very big spread of questions that like, try and measure very, very low levels of happiness versus sort of moderately okay ones. So again, you know, different tools, measurement tools, and these items are all measurement tools, are going to be appropriate for different populations of people. Okay, so that statistical model, uh, the RASH model, maps onto this idea of RASH measurement, which is not a statistical model, really. It's more of a theory of measurement, as well as just the <coughs> statistical model I've just described. Now, I'm not going to go into what those rather detailed uh, derivations of the model are, but if that particular statistical model holds, this idea that we can describe people's item responses using that, then that's got some really rather desirable properties as an instrument of measurement. So one of them is called this idea of specific objectivity. Again, nice obfuscating sort of uh, phrase. The idea is generally that any two items should rank two in the, sorry, each item should rank two individuals similarly, and each person should rank two items similarly. It's just like saying that if I take two thermometers, they should tell me what, you know, if I take two people, they should be uh, ranked by any particular thermometer in terms of their temperature. And this idea of, you know, the idea that it's not the particular measurement tool that gives you an outcome, these things should be universally and objective in their ability uh, to measure people. That's sort of been well and, and long understood in, in sort of physical measurement, but it can break down with, as we'll see, um, in psychometric measurement. Uh, and another particular desirable property of these uh, RASH models, if, if, again, if, if you've got a measurement tool that conforms to it, is the idea of some score sufficiency. So that if you've got a model, if you've got a set of uh, a measurement tool that conforms to this model, then if you've got some binary items, you can just add them up, and that will be a, an unbiased, sufficient statistic to tell you about the, the level of the latent trait of the person. It's really the number of endorsements uh, that tells us about the trait and not their pattern. Again, there's other item response theories like Gutman response scaling and things like that, scalograms, where the pattern of responses is important. On this one, we're just interested in the number of items um, that you uh, tick. Uh, so I said that things like specific objectivity can break down. And here's an example. So I've got an additional question I would like to ask uh, for my research study. So if I wanted to, I could probably afford to do the following this month. Climb up a mountain. Now... I fought with my colleagues to get this on the questionnaire because uh, you know, I swore this is going to really tell me something interesting about perceived disposable wealth. Um, mountaineering, it's a you know, posh people's uh, activity. Uh, you might need money to go and climb up a mountain. You might need to travel to the mountain. You might need to buy a warm jacket, that sort of thing. But there's not, it's not a whole story, is it, really? You need knowledge, some physical ability to go climb up a mountain. It's not asking just about wealth. So if we imagine some hypothetical item... Uh, uh, characteristic curves, we might imagine we get something like this. So um, at very low levels, you might get perhaps slightly higher uh, probabilities of observing uh, mountain climbing than you might think. And at very high levels, you might get slightly lower levels than you expect. <clears throat> Why might that be? Well, again, at very low levels, it might not really be dependent upon money. You might live near a mountain and quite like it. You might go uh, in a club, friends give you a lift down there, that sort of thing. Again, these are just hypothetical examples for why you might see something departing from your uh, nice specific objectivity. At high levels, people might be less able to climb a mountain because they've just been living the good life too much. And they've got as much money as they need, but all, you know, they don't fancy getting up uh, that mountain. So what we've got here is a situation where uh, this specific objectivity uh, is broken down. So if you are at very low levels of trait levels, then the easiest item, if you like, the one with the highest probability of endorsement, is uh, mountain climbing. At very high levels, uh, it's the hardest item, if you like. It's, uh, you know, it's got the lowest probability of being endorsed. Those items, these things should be all parallel. If we've got each individual item should measure two individuals always with the same sort of uh, uh, level of trait. So we might need to revise our statistical model to take that into account. So what I've done here 
is included an extra little parameter called A, which in the lingo is called the discrimination of item A. And this has got a, a very close association with the idea of a factor loading in factor analysis uh, or an item slope in regression analysis. So it's another property of an item. So we've got two things, two parameters that tell us about the properties of the item now. So this one's called a two-parameter model, full of, uh, you know, joie de vivre, these people who named these uh, things. Um, what does it do? Okay, so it multiplies the latent trait. It's such a something that, you know, it's like a discount factor for the latent trait. If uh, we had, uh, you know, as, as it gets closer towards zero, these slopes become flatter. So if you think about the idea that if A was zero, this would be completely flat, and in effect, we would know nothing about the person's latent trait based, around, based upon that item, because we would expect at very low levels an item response of 0.5, at very high levels an item response of 0.5, or whatever the uh, B level was of the item. Completely flat. If, again, if, imagine if it was zero, and it multiplied the latent trait. It just takes this whole bit out of the entire uh, equation. And so basically, we're getting no information from this item. You can sort of view it, again, as this idea of what's the correlation between the item and the latent trait. How much information, um, how well, how strongly is this item associated uh, with this latent trait? And so we've seen there in this hypothetical example that climbing up mountains isn't perhaps necessarily as strongly associated with perceived disposable wealth as the other things are. That's sort of it, really, in terms of that model that I'm going to talk about. Uh, that was all made up stuff. So now I'm going to show you and hopefully demonstrate just the same points by using some real data. Uh, so we've got the Brit British Social Aptitude Survey. Uh, I think they conduct it most years. These the data are from 2009. It's a large-ish nationally representative household survey where people get asked about their social attitudes. So I've taken four questions from that survey. Uh, the first three are based around the STEM. How do you think you would feel if a person with a mental health condition such as depression or a personality disorder had been appointed your boss, had joined your quiz team, community group or swimming club, uh, were to marry or to have, uh, and to have family with one of your close relatives? And for each of those, people were asked if they're very somewhat comfortable or very somewhat uncomfortable. Four responses can be subsumed within a different type of item response theory model. For ease of interpretation here, I've just collapsed that down to a binary, whereby people have all you know, comfortable responses on one side, uncomfortable responses on another. So a good thing, okay, that I'm, you know, I'm perhaps trying to look at the idea of a latent trait where people are uh, more or less comfortable <coughs> with the idea of having some sort of you know, social interaction or narrowing of social distance with people who they know or believe to have a mental health disorder such as depression or personality disorder. There's another question in there. Generally speaking, do you think there's a lot of prejudice in Britain against disabled people in general? And people say a lot or a little versus hardly any or none. A slightly different question. Now, on the one hand, I might have a hypothesis that says, well, generally speaking, you know, people are just going to have generally biased attitudes towards people they see as having uh, you know, weaknesses such as mental or physical disability on the one hand or not. And so that would be a unidimensional idea. There's just levels of you know, uncomfortableness versus comfortableness. A slightly more nuanced one would say, okay, people are, are going to make differentiation. They might be more worried or bothered by mental health than by physical health, or vice versa. And this question isn't a particularly good one to say because it doesn't make a distinction. So I've got four questions there. And I'm going to fit uh, an item, a couple of item response theory models to the data. So what might be my model strategy? Well, it'd be quite handy if the one par parameter model fit OK, then I could claim rash measurement and I could start to make lots of inferences about the mathematical properties of the sum scores and things like that, and that would be nice. To test that, what I'm going to do is fit a one parameter model and then a two parameter model and see which model fits best. And if the two parameter model fits best, and I look at the item characteristic curves and I see there's lots of uh, you know, violation of specific objectivity, then that tells me that it might not be a good idea to just simply treat the responses to these items, uh, to those questions, and, and just add them up and, and assume that they're some sort of unidimensional scale. 
while I'm at it, why don't I actually, rather than just boring old factor analytic and questionnaire studies where people just lump everything into an exploratory analysis, why don't I make some, some specific um, hypotheses about my data that I can translate nice and specifically into per, you know, these parameters of these models? So for instance, okay, I'm going to make some hypotheses about the idea of social distance or social uh, lock-in that will predict acceptability. So I'm going to say that the narrower the social distance between me and the person with the mental health, the greater there is likely to be in terms of uh, uncomfortableness. So I think the, you know, the threshold for people saying, yes, I'm uncomfortable, is going to be lower for the closest type of social interaction, which is someone who's actually a member of my family. So I'm going to predict that um, the, the B parameter, which is this item difficulty, this threshold thing, of which uh, you know, someone's got to get over, like the cost of a cup of coffee or whatever, this one's going to be like coffee. It's going to not take much sort of prejudice, not take much uncomfortableness for people to you know, say, yeah, I would be uncomfortable with marriage. And I'm going to say that's going to be less for the boss, which I might have to meet every day and stuff, but actually, you know, it's going to, and that's going to be less than, say, group, because I could always join another group, or I might just you know, let 500 of others. I'm not quite sure what I would think about the prejudice item. So, you know, I can start to make hypotheses, <coughs> very specific hypotheses that I can cast in terms of the item parameters. What I talked about earlier, about the idea that the prejudice question might be something that's not part of the same construct. So it might be not related to perceptions of comfort or discomfort with mental health. So I could say that the item uh, discrimination parameter for prejudice is going to be less than any of those for those other items. So I've said, in effect, that this disability question... Uh, is you know, part of a different construct. It's going to be less well related. And these are just a few. You can imagine there's lots and lots of different types of um, hypotheses you can actually put and fix down in terms of the model before you go on to test them. Uh, you don't just have to be exploratory with these sort of models. Okay, there's the results, uh, the proper results of the one parameter model. Uh, the reason it looks like there's only three lines is because the lines for prejudice and group are identical pretty much in terms of their B parameters. So actually my hypothesis, my first one was wrong. People uh, have got a, uh, a lower threshold for having their boss and feeling comfortable with their boss as uh, uh, having a mental health condition than marriage. And these two are significantly different uh, from one another. So the idea is this item for boss is further down this way. So you require a lower level of the latent trait, whatever it is, before you're likely to see a positive item response than you do for the marriage question, which is similar, but because we've got a nice sort of 3,000 person sample, we've got enough statistical power to distinguish between those two um, parameters. A long way off into this way is the idea of you know, people joining your club and thinking about prejudice. And so actually you need really quite a lot of, of latent uncomfortableness with mental health stroke prejudice before you're likely to see people ticking this box. Okay, so that would be nice if that were true. What happens if I fit the, uh, what the results from the two parameter model look like? Quite different uh, for one of the items. So here's the prejudice item now. Now I'm allowing these items to show to the extent to which they're correlated with these latent traits. This prejudice item is conforming to my second hypothesis that I had earlier. It's really got a much lower slope. It's almost flat for this prejudice item. So this prejudice item is telling me almost nothing in terms of whatever it is that these three other items are telling me. So whatever this latent trait is, and again, it's only its meaning is only given to it by what these questions are, um, but it definitely shows us that these three items are measuring one thing, and this is measuring something else. But these other three uh, have got slopes that are not significantly different from one another. So if I had a little scale composed of these three items, then I could probably reasonably safely sum them up together and use them as an idea of a, a little measure of what somebody's trait comfortableness with mental health would be in these three uh, uh, scenarios. So this little scale of three items would be quite good at sort of telling me about people who've got moderately average to high levels of, uh, of acceptance uh, of mental health issues but it wouldn't tell me very much about people who might be very prejudiced against mental health because I've got no items that are mapping onto very sort of low levels of tolerance. Really. So again, it might not be very good. If I was doing a study looking at intolerance to mental health, these might not be very good items to use. They're not really telling me very much about this sort of low end of the scale. 
you don't have to stop there. We've just got a measurement model. Uh, but we could have further hypotheses. We've, we've measured something. We've got a latent trait. Uh, and here about comfortableness with you know, people with mental health uh, issues. But we might want to decide, well, what predicts that? You know, so we might have some hypotheses about age or cohort. Very difficult to uh, distinguish these two things. You know, someone who's, say, older was also born in a different time and they might have been socialised into different beliefs. So, but either way, we could say, right, we might have a measurement of age in the same study. And I could say, OK, well, I think attitudes to mental health generally are going to be less positive with age. So I could just say, right then, as well as uh, theta being part of the model, so this is the, the trait bit, I'm going to say, I'm going to predict the trait bit as being a function of some parameter multiplied by age. So that's just like the B parameter in regression multiplied by age. And that actually is positive and significant. People seem to be less comfortable with people with mental health issues in this British Social Attitude Survey uh, as age increases, comfortableness goes down. I might have more specific hypotheses yet. I might say that as well as being generally related to age, I think specifically marriage has, has, has changed its meaning over time. And so that it means something differently. I perhaps had more sanctity or mean, you know, strength socially in older cohorts. And I think the marriage question specifically, as well as age in general, uh, is going to be specifically related to age. And so I could take one of the item parameters, say the B, the you know, difficulty parameter for marriage, and I could say that's going to be a function of age too. And again, that is also significant. So as well as generally all the people finding mental health, being less comfortable with people with mental health issues than younger people, even taking that into account, they're still even more specifically less comfortable with the idea of marriage, uh, in you know, somebody marrying into their family with a mental health issue. And so these are, you know, if you like, true things of the British Social Attitudes Survey data. The advantages of using, by the way, uh, a latent trait model like of this is that, it, in some sense, we get a pure measure of uh, uh, the latent traits, you know, with some of the measurement error scrubbed away, for reasons that I won't <coughs> go into uh, today. That's just about it. That is just one type of in item response theory model. There are literally dozens of these that have all got specific uses that are specifically uh, suited for different types of latent traits and different types of uh, underlying processes um, that you might be interested in. So, for instance, those models just assumed a monotonic relationship, so that as the latent trait goes up, the response probability goes up. And that's not always the case for different certain types of attitudes. So, who agrees with the following? A whole lot of life prison sentence gives the murderer what he deserves. Okay, so what can I infer from your lack of agreement with that statement? Meaningless. No, well, I don't know. I'd say it's not meaningless. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, but what, can I infer anything about your beliefs about capital punishment, say, uh, or whole-of-life prison sentences, say, or prison in general? I don't know. It's, these sort of uh, questions uh, tend to have non-monotonic uh, response probabilities, given a, a particular trait level. So, for instance, it might see that a very low, sort of, you know, a lenient, the idea of social leniency... You could say, well, okay, uh, I disagree with that statement because putting someone in prison for the whole of their life is far too harsh. And so people at this end would say, that's just not, you know, the person who committed the crime when they were perhaps a stupid teenager isn't the same person they're going to be when they're 70 years old on their deathbed. That's much too harsh. I'm going to disagree at that end. At the other end, I might be a Daily Mail reading hang em high too bloody lenient for them. You know, these people who go out and murder them, they should be hung from their fingernails and then hung, drawn and quartered. So I might disagree with the, uh, the statement from above, if you like. So we've got these types of, some types of questions. You get disagreement from below, disagreement from above. And there's like a sweet spot of the trait level whereby you'd expect someone to agree with that question. A lot of things in pol politics, a lot of issue-based things, uh, uh, often conform to this type of what's called an unfolding item response uh, model. And so it would be completely inappropriate try and answer, you know, just add up questions like that with item responses um, into a, a measure. And again, that's just one other type of item response theory. There's, oh, there's loads of them. So that's about me done. Uh, I'll just summarise to say that item response theory is both a measurement uh, theory that maps data uh, observed on participants onto hypothetical latent traits. And it's also a family of statistical models that can be used to assess the validity of those uh, theories of measurement.
this sort of thing, I wouldn't, you know, it's one measurement theory, there are others, but what I would say is that take measurement seriously. It, using something like this makes explicit some of the assumptions that you might otherwise not make explicit and just do anyway without realising it, about making inferences based upon observed data about latent quantities that you can't observe directly based upon observations. You can use these, this tool specifically to assess the reliability and validity uh, of those observations, which is important, I would say, for any empirical science, qualitative or quantitative. Um, this happens to be more suitable for quantitative data, but there are non-parametric, very quanti uh, qualitative in their approach atom response theory measures. And it provides a tool to be very specific about testing uh, and specifying detailed substantive hypotheses. And there's lots of information that will be on the website, it's probably too much here, for if you want to learn about the theory of item response, if you want to actually learn how to do it in practice. I forgot to put up a course actually next March. If you look at the CCSR website, so that's the Census for, Cen for Census and Survey Research downstairs website, there's a, a little course about structural equation modelling where you'll be able to learn how to do that. And that course is online if you want to download it. If you know, if you've got access to the Stata package, then there's, uh, uh, there's some good resources there for how to fit these sort of models. Ah, it's free. Enough said. If you want to be able to learn how to use these things, uh, R, to fit these sort of models. If you're a lowly SPSS user, you can just about fit a one-parameter model using the latest version, but not really anything else, uh, unless some references. Thank you.